What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have a uh, friend in the making, by the way, Brian McLean, on the show. Uh, thank you for being on. Uh, Thanks for having was, me. Yes. I got a chance to meet Brian through uh, one of the publications here in Austin. Uh, and I, we're, we're in a season right now in our office where we're deciding, do we extend the lease? Do we buy a property? And uh, I was opening this magazine and I saw Brian's face and I said, let me call this guy. You know, and there's there's such a part of doing business with people in terms of their the way that they communicate, the way that they answer questions, their level of depth. And I, I start, I said, hey, you know what? Can you come out to my office to check out what we do um, and show you the office? This is what I'm thinking. Came out, educated us. And from there, we had a sushi lunch and talked. And the level of detail, the level of uh, explanation, the process was just phenomenal that we wanted to have him on the show. Um, and it worked out to be today. So for those of you guys that are de deciding, you know, do I continue to rent? Uh, do I uh, purchase a building? If I'm going to purchase a building, what should I look out for? What's the process look like? We're going to jump into that today and we're going through it ourselves. So I'm going to even be asking some of my questions and they may be a, re a, re a repeat of the questions I asked you, but great. I think it'll be great for the, for everybody, for the audience. So Brian, thanks for being on today, brother. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. So, so tell us, uh, I know that you didn't start off in commercial real estate. Correct. Tell us how you, what, what your career was, and then tell us why you got into commercial real sure. estate. Right. So I, I was an engineering graduate from the University of Texas. Um, I spent two decades in construction, uh, mostly very, very large projects, right? Hospitals, airports. Uh, we built the Samsung facility here in Austin. And I was, you know, all in on doing heavy construction, right? Which is a, a very, very challenging career, uh, rewarding career, but... Um, when we were doing the second renovation to the Samsung facility here, uh, my boss before creating a construction company was a commercial real estate broker. And he honestly didn't give me a choice. He told me to go to real estate school and get my license. I think he had, he had a long-term strategy of getting back into commercial real estate and commercial development, which is what he did before he got so involved with construction at Samsung, right? And so I I did just that, I got licensed. And this was 09, I believe. I'm, I need to remember my dates, but at the time, Trek uh, changed the ruling. In order to become a broker, you don't just need five years of practice. You need also an X amount of transactions that you have to perform during those five years if you're even eligible to take the broker exam. And so he told me to go hang my license with a residential broker so that I could accrue those transactions, right? Um, and so I did just that. And so I started off in residential real estate. Um, I sold uh, predominantly, I would say 50% of my transactions would be in Lake Travis ISD where I live and the other half, you know, scattered throughout Austin based off of where my clients um, were buying or selling, right? And so I was a dual career individual. I was building a uh, very large construction project during the day and then was hustling um, and selling real estate on nights and weekends and um, got a book of business that was too much to handle and, and my wife got licensed and we were kind of a husband wife tandem for a couple of years, right? And the, I think my introduction to commercial real estate be, came because, um, I'm gonna use Lake Travis ISD as, as a classic example, right? You're looking at uh, individuals that purchase real estate, oftentimes above a million dollars. They started to understand that my level of sophistication um, and market value was above what they would consider the normal caliber of a residential agent. And they started asking me questions like, oh, I'm actually looking to lease this commercial space. Do you have something to, to advise me on that? 100%, right? And so I would do one or two commercial transactions a year, whether it's uh, buying or selling or commercial leasing, which is very challenging, right? I mean, very complex, very uh, difficult contracts, very sophisticated negotiations. Um, and started capturing more and more business that way because commercial real estate is a lot of, of word of mouth type networking, right? And so when I launched my own firm, I, I truly launched a firm that catered to both commercial agents and residential agents. And so um, that was 
right before the pandemic and I now have 29 residential agents and I have three commercial agents and the majority of my residential book of business I pass down to those agents and then I predominantly focus on commercial real estate myself and then the the other two agents that I work with we have very intense collaboration amongst the two of us and so although I broker a lot more residential agents I spend a lot more of my time in the commercial real estate sector simply because the deals are so much more sophisticated um, the oftentimes they take months right of, of work and so that is where I'm at and so um, and then the the advertisement uh, that you saw in the magazine um, I had a good friend of mine who was kind of what I would consider the go-to local commercial broker in Lake Travis ISD. He stepped out of the game and does his own development, right? And I'm like, well, here's my opportunity to really brand myself as that go-to local commercial real estate broker people can trust, right? And, you know, and I really think it starts with like very introductory type questions like the ones you asked me the first time you met me, right? And, and people are constantly, you know, evaluating you to find out um, if I have the the expertise and the for sure i was right, yeah to deliver right and so that's that's where i'm at mm -hmm. yeah do you so your uh, uh your expertise of engineering building business uh buildings right so infrastructure mm -hmm. that plays a huge role i'm it assuming does. in, in right. what you do because your level of specificity when i'm asking you questions i could tell like you know more of the process than, than maybe a salesperson just selling a a, a building does correct yeah. yeah i would say so 100 percent right and you know, if you look at the predominant book of business that we do, um, it's either development oriented, meaning uh, buying or selling tracts of land, re-entitling them, replatting them, re-engineering them, possibly even developing them, or like yourself, right? And I'm going to use commercial leasing, right? Commercial leasing, the tenant improvement build out of it is a major, major component, right? Um, and just understanding that scope alone. Uh, put you ahead of the game, especially for not only negotiations, but educating the client, right? I mean, um, if I, you know, I had a dollar every time I met someone that wanted to build a bar or, uh, you know, uh, build a daycare, you know, help, helping them understand what level of construction they have to do in order to achieve that. They don't, they don't understand it, you know? Not I mean? at all. No. No, it's super in depth. Yep. Okay, so let's let's start kind of at the beginning and the basic. I'm right. renting an office. Yes. Okay. Um, and we can. I don't know if the the number is there a certain dollar amount actually where if I'm renting an office, it kind of makes sense that maybe I should consider purchasing one. Mm -hmm. Is there is there like hey if I'm at ten thousand a month or for twenty thousand a size, month for right? for me it's different and I'll mm -hmm. kind of get to mine. But if right. I'm a new person or I'm I'm a, I'm a small business owner, right? I'm renting a space. I'm watching this podcast. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain dollar amount that once I'm there, I can consider maybe purchasing a small building? Yeah, I would say the financial aspect often is the dictator, right? Um, and I'm gonna use a, a stereotypical first time commercial tenant, right? Okay. Maybe they have an SBA loan um, okay. or some sort of financing of that nature, right? Much, much easier to apply and achieve an SBA loan wrapped around a commercial lease than it is to say, okay, I'm going to go acquire my very first building, right? Um, you're also talking about a tremendous difference in cost. And so, you know, if you're looking at, um, and I'm gonna use a 5,000 square foot building, right? Which is kind of a, a very customary size, especially for someone in retail, you know, they're, they're looking at $30 a square foot, you know, plus triple net, right? So that's something very tangible they can understand, right? Whereas the cost to acquire real estate is variable, right? What condition is the building in? Um, what all do you? What all operating expenses do you have to utilize to get it uh, to function how you need it to, right? Um, and the there's also a level of risk associated, right? And so um, the I think when people when people are looking at the entry level of whether or not they can buy or lease commercial real estate, the 
the understanding of their risk in leasing is a lot easier to calculate, right? It's a monthly rent that they owe each month. Correct. Right? So let's let's simplify it. So mm -hmm. that five thousand square foot example, mm -hmm. thirty dollars a foot, right? Divided by twelve, that's an annual. Score, that's right. Right. Mm -hmm. So divide by twelve, I'm at like two dollars and fifty cents a square foot mm -hmm. per month. So I did the math: twelve thousand five hundred right. a month. That's right. So if I'm, hey, I need a five thousand square foot office, I can afford twelve thousand, thirteen thousand in my lease. Right. Right. I know what I'm, what my exposure is that's every right. single month. Okay. And that's wrapped around your business plan that's tied to your financing, right? Correct. So just a lot easier for someone to manage, right? Okay. And the amount of capital that they need out of the gate is minimized. And it's usually the tenant improvement, right? How much build out are they going to perform for that particular space, right? Of which they're going to try to leverage some of that on the landlord, right? Uh, to yeah. help cover some of those costs. Yeah, when we've come into offices, it's been, hey, this is, we need this wall torn down. We need an extra office here. We need carpet, we need paint, we need this. And they build right. that into our lease. Well, how long do you want to stay here? You know, you're asking for all this. We're not going to give it to you if you're only going to be here for a year. Are you willing to do five year, four year, three year, and so forth? Mm -hmm. You also have to think about location, right? And so, uh, and I'm going to use that 5,000 square foot retail building, right? Um, location oftentimes dictates how successful someone's business is going to be, of right? Course, Whether yes. it's walkability, how many cars pass through there uh, every single day, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, to try to say, okay, well, I'm leasing this space right here. It's on I-35. The anchor tenant is an HEB, right? Which is about as good as it gets. And versus I can buy this 5,000 square foot building, but it doesn't have any of that. You know what I mean? You're really trying at that point, you're really having to script a different type of risk, which is how much loss of business is there in order to own the real estate versus leasing something that is in a high demand, high traffic area. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it depends on the type of business you're in. That's right. Whereas like I went to get my blood drawn the other day. I went to a doctor's office. It was in the middle of this place behind a bush. I, I would, I, I, they don't get walk up traffic saying, Hey, That's I want to get my blood drawn. Right. Like, so it doesn't need to be where it's visible, but maybe if I'm a, a, a retail shop where I need walk in business, That's right. you know, a small tax office where, Hey, you're walking in or uh, a barber shop or a small bar or restaurant. That's more important. Obviously. Right. So from the financial standpoint, real quick, if I'm, if I'm affording this 12,500 mm -hmm. every month, I'm paying my rent. Right. Am I at a season? Am I at a place? Like, is there, that's what I was asking. Is there a dollar amount when somebody's paying rent where it's like, Hey, at this dollar amount, you could consider buying a building. I think it's more of a percentage, right? Okay. Um, when you're looking at, and I'm going to use retail, I think it's a little bit easier to qualify. Okay. Right? Um, when you're looking at gross sales, at what percentage is your rent versus those gross sales? I think that's where the conversation starts. It's not necessarily the dollar amount, okay. but is it is your rent 50% of your gross sales? Okay. Right? Then we have a problem. And these are similar calculations that you see people do when they're looking at purchasing residential real estate. Sure, right? yes. And in order to qualify for a loan, your DTI can't be that high, right? You can't, you can't have debt from a single asset that's taking 50% of your income for right? sure too much. Right. And so I think really that's it. Now, what okay. is the magic number? Yeah. Um, probably around 33% somewhere south of 40, just like it is in residential mortgages. So right? you're seeing, you're seeing that if out of my income coming in, right. 33 to 40% is going towards my, my business, my right. rent. Correct. And I'm able to still be remain profitable mm -hmm. that it may make sense at that point to consider purchasing something small if possible. Yeah. If you get north of that 40 percent number, uh, then you, I would definitely recommend looking at different options. OK, got it. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I'm doing that. What about reserves? You know, do I if I'm going to buy a building, you know, sure. my cost, my my focus would be, man, how much do I have to put down? So maybe we, we start there. How much right. do I have to put down? Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned an SBA loan. So if I'm thinking about buying a building, what right. is the down payment? What percentage of a, of a building is it normal that a business owner has to bring for the down payment? Off the collar, I would say 25%, right? Okay. Um, I think that's a good standard to, to think of. I think some banks would probably lean closer to 20%, um, but I really try to target that 25 
So yeah. if I'm buying a million dollar building, mm-hmm. I need to bring two hundred fifty thousand dollars as my down payment. That's right. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then what about reserves? Do they have? And maybe I know that's more of a lending question, but well, I think it's no. I think that falls in my category, right? Okay. And so this is where the education of the client really, you know, goes to the next level, right? And so you're talking about uh, capital that they need to have on reserve, operating expenses that they need to have on reserve, right? And you know, industry experts will tell you a minimum six months, right? Six months of operating capital. I, I recommend twelve. And, you know, I think there's there's too many unforeseen conditions um, that, you know, I, I've just seen too many companies that didn't didn't have enough reserves in order to understand what it takes to truly get their revenue optimized and how long that takes. You know what I mean? Especially when you I'm just going to use another example of the not only does the TI, the, the tenant improvement build out cost money, it takes time, right? And I'm gonna use Lakeway or even City of Austin as example, right? Just the time to pull the permits could be six to 12 months, right? During that time, you're probably taking on interest from debt already, you see what I mean? And you're shelling out money to that general contractor um, and design team or whatever it is to get that product ready to be built out, right? And so that capex and that opex oftentimes becomes the dictator of whether or not the person can proceed right simply because and i think it's kind of the same way in residential real estate i you know a lot of first time home buyers will um they'll say okay i've i've got the 5% down payment okay great do you uh do you have enough for closing costs do you have enough to move right do you have enough money um left over to you know to understand that you need some operating capital, you know, while you transition into this real estate, you know, it's it's somewhat similar, but just more complex and a higher value, right, in commercial real estate. What percentage of businesses do you see rent versus own their building? Hmm. So, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that, mostly because predominantly in commercial real estate, we sell land. Um, we either sell land to people that are going to get it ready to develop it or going to develop it. Right. Okay. And they, a lot of times pay with cash. Right. Um, and, and then my second most, um, client would be commercial leasing. Right. Um, so the, that barrier number that you're speaking of as to where, where does the commercial leasing need to get tabled and the commercial acquisition come into play that doesn't happen as frequently as you think right yeah i would i would think that uh all the additional expenses of maintaining the building because mm-hmm. if a lot of the if if you're at that 20 30 33 percent of just the cost of the loan right, right. the the taxes insurance Correct. debt you know all that stuff but then now that the breakdown you know you have an ac that breaks down you need to put a new AC. You have a plumbing leak on a much larger property. Right. Right. We had a plumbing leak on the house. You know, you call a plumber, it's a few hundred dollars, maybe a thousand, right. two thousand. You do that in a building, it's ten thousand, twenty thousand, you know. So that is not as applicable as you may think. Okay. And the main reason why it is applicable if it's an owner occupied building. Right? Okay. The majority of people that own commercial real estate lease it to other companies i.e. the owner of this building is leasing part of it to your company. Correct. Right? And so the the commercial leases in Texas are predominantly triple net, right? And triple net protects a ton of exposure for the landlord, right? So the tenants are responsible for um, the common area maintenance, the insurance. So the taxes, lobby, the outside, the entryway, yeah, common area maintenance. You know, if an AC unit craps out, right? That cost is burdened by the tenants, right? And so um, that is where the majority of commercial real estate people or landlords, that's why they like to own real estate, right? Is because the commercial leasing that we use here in Texas really shields them from a lot of exposure. So break triple net down, common area maintenance, Mm -hmm. or common area maintenance. Property taxes and insurance. Property taxes and insurance, Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, that's the three. And okay, and then maintenance on oh, so common area and maintenance. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, got it. Yeah, not just the daily upkeep of mowing the lawn and stuff, but yeah, 
um, you know, there's every contract is different, right? Where does that boundary between the landlord's exposure and the tenants start and stop, right? You know, hail damage to the roof, eh, gray area, right? Depends on how that contract is written. Um, but, uh, you know, issues like you spoke of, uh, a plumbing leak, right? It really just depends. It, but most oftentimes it's burdened by the tenants. Got it. And I'm thinking about it because for me, and I don't know the, the people watching this, if they're more of an investor or more of a small business owner, I'm assuming it's more of a small business owner right. trying to acquire a building. I'm sure. thinking about it as it's going to be my expense because it's going to be owner occupied. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So you'd recommend uh, uh, they got to put 20 to 25% down. Correct. And then from there, they got to have around 12 months of operating expenses. That's what I recommend. S saved. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so if I want to consider starting to purchase a building, look at maybe acquiring a building, right. where should I start? When should I start? So the process is much, much longer than residential real estate, right? But okay. it all begins with securing your financing, right? Um, I think, you know, obviously understanding your budget, which includes those two, uh, reserves that we spoke of and having a true business plan, right? Um, uh, is what I highly recommend before you even start shopping. And then in commercial real estate, the time between um, when you start showing property and by the time you close on it and occupy the property is a much, much longer period, right? Because uh, I would say typically, and I'm gonna use, um, I'm gonna use a building that's maybe 10,000 square feet, right? You're gonna have in residential real estate, you would probably have like a seven day option, right? And a 30 day close. That's something that we see, you know, day in and day out. Sure. Here in the seven days to do my inspection. That's right. And then within 30 days, we got to close by this day. That's right. Yep. In commercial real estate, that's probably going to be a minimum of 30 days, more like 45 days of due diligence. Right. Okay. And, and in that time, not only are you inspecting the building, you're trying to figure out the costs to, um, take care of any of those maintenance issues, but also understand how are you going to build that property out um, to suit your needs, right? And that includes everything from, you know, we have to, you, you oftentimes have to redesign, you have to repermit, right? And then you have to build it out. And so the, based on what risk you're willing to take on as a buyer could dictate how long that's gonna pull the closing out, right? If, if I'm a buyer, if I'm representing a buyer, I'm not closing until we feel like we have that, you know, green light from the city of Austin that the permitting is going to happen. So what you don't want to have happen is you purchase the building and you're sitting on it for six plus months until you can even start to retrofit it to move in, right? You don't want to sit there and burden those costs um, and have debt servicing and, and lack of, of income, right? So all that dictates how long that process takes, right? It could take a year to close on a commercial building. So right? my inspection period, my inspection period is 30 to 45 days. Yes. Okay. They call it uh, feasibility. Feasibility. Mm -hmm. But what if I don't want to, like you said, what if I don't want to buy that building until I have approved plans, permits, right. things like that? Mm -hmm. What, what, what am I, you're, you're locking that sale up, aren't you? Yes and no. Right. So it's, it's very similar to a residential contract where in, uh, in residential, we have option, right? So I think the best way to describe that is during option, you have a unilateral contract. The seller must perform, but the buyer has option, right? Okay. Not until option is over and those contingencies are done, does it become a bilateral contract where most both parties have to perform and close. Right? Okay. Similarly, in commercial real estate, they call it feasibility, which typically means if you terminate during feasibility, you get your earnest money back and you don't have to close on the property, right? Okay. So you want to you want to make sure you have covered 100% of your exposure during feasibility, right? So uh, that time frame, how long can you extend it for? You can extend. Oftentimes that's dictated early in advance, right? And I'm gonna use um, a contract that I saw uh, last week, right? Which okay. was a 45 day feasibility with the option of two uh, 15 day extensions, right? And so in that time frame, you have the ability to go to the city and see if they will That's appro right. approve that modification? 
That's right. So you kind of need to have a contractor or somebody that's going to be doing the work. It's a team. You've got an architect, okay. an engineer. You've got the, the general contractor, um, your broker, right? Everybody, it's all hands on deck um, during that time to make sure that the exact product that is needed, um, we can close on it and, and pull the trigger on whatever functional uh, work that needs to be done can happen, right? So that, so that you're not eating any additional costs right okay so it sounds like first i I'm, I'm interested in potentially doing it so i reach out to somebody like yourself right right and then secondly you say hey here are some options for you let me connect you with a lender which is like what we did right right mm -hmm. so then i go meet with that lender and it, i think when we spoke it was 10 percent down and then the bank did and i know every bank is different but i think the bank did uh the 50 percent and sba did the other 40 or something right. like that mm -hmm. So that gave us kind of a ballpark, and now we're getting the finances over to him right. uh, to say, hey, this is what you can purchase, right? Right. And then when we spoke at that lunch, we talked about uh, if this is the max loan amount, you don't want to purchase a building at the max loan amount. Correct. You want to build in that construction, redevelopment, tenant improvement 100%. into your loan. And so a lot of people, the misconception they may have is, well, I got to have all this money to do the tenant improvement. You can actually build in the tenant improvement, right. the upgrades into the loan that you're getting. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, okay. because if you think about um, the bank's exposure, right, is in the event someone uh, forfeits, right? They, they cannot handle the loan and the bank has to seize the asset. Those improvements have improved the value of the property, right? And so they're underwriting the loan based off of what I call A plus B, meaning the as is value of the property plus these improvements, what was the market value of the property then, right? And so they're, they're leaning on that. You see what I mean? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so then um, we get that over to the bank. So I sit with whatever banker I'm using. Right. They kind of give me a budget, mm -hmm. right? Of this is what you can qualify for. Sure. Right? And then from there, the next step is we start to look for properties that are within our budget. Correct. Okay. When and and you're factoring in that you're going to have to put in a certain amount on top of whatever the sales price is for your tenant improvement, right? So if I qualified for let's say five million, but I know hey maybe tenant improvement, what's a good number for that? Twenty percent, twenty five percent of the purchase. <coughs> I usually don't judge it based off a of percentage. I usually judge it based off of a cost per square foot. Okay. Right? Okay, there we go. So, so mm -hmm. far we've talked about, it's not, can I afford the monthly in terms of dollar, it's what right. percentage of my income it is for buying a building. And now in terms of tenant improvement, it's more on a percentage as well of the square foot. Right. So what is a, what is a percentage of square foot mm -hmm. that you factor in for tenant improvement? You know, I would say um, for a traditional build out, probably $125 a square foot. If you're starting from scratch, probably closer to $250 a square foot, meaning you have to bring in the HVAC, the plumbing, right? The, the electrical systems. Okay. Um, but if you're, if you're talking about, you know, retrofitting a property that has those systems, uh, but you have to move walls, you have to move uh, items, I think, you know, my, I typically start at $125 a square. $125 right? for the tenant improvement. Correct. So if I'm buying a 10,000 square foot building times 125, I need to factor in 1,250 for TI work. Right. Now that's, that's on the high end. Right. Um, okay. but, um, again, it, it really just depends on what build out we're talking about. For right? sure. Building a, a five star restaurant versus, um, I would call this class B office space, uh -huh. right? Different levels. This is probably closer to $75 a square foot. You know okay. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Got it. So depending on the type of bill business I'm in will obviously affect the per square foot the on the tenant finish, improvement right. and the mm -hmm. level finish. Okay. That's right. So then we factor that in. So that's a conversation where if I'm, if I'm with somebody that's not as seasoned in commercial real estate, cause maybe they're not used to so much building. Like a lot of the, the, the people that I've worked with, they lease offices, whereas they're not maybe leasing as much restaurants or hotels or sure. these other things. So mm -hmm. they're not thinking about all those things and walking that client through it. Right. You know, and a client that maybe has never built out a restaurant, you know, they kind of have a ballpark, but it really, it really, it, for me, it, they really buying a house, 
get it buying a commercial building you really need somebody to assist you with this it's a lot more complex or you can make a whole lot of mistakes big time and lose and, and lose a lot of you know almost everything you work for basically correct so okay so I meet with the lender we get that we start shopping the market we kind of have a uh, for we know our our business type what our rehab costs are gonna be for sure. tenant improvement right okay so that gives me a ballpark of uh, what I'm going to uh, to spend on a building right so now we find a building that we like it's in that ballpark cost wise that next step is to do that feasibility correct right so that I mean the next step in commercial real estate there's a step in between going on a contract. It's okay. called a letter of intent. Okay. Um, so in residential real estate, your offer is in fact the contract, right? You are sending over the Correct. promulgated, usually one to four family contract as your formal offer, right? In residential, or excuse me, in a commercial real estate, we send a letter of intent, okay. which is usually a two to three page document that outlines the terms of the contract. And so um, that letter of intent is the negotiation tool between the buyer and the seller, right? And the, the main mechanism that it's used for is because in commercial real estate, predominantly you don't use promulgated forms, right? And so in residential real estate, you're required to, right? The Texas Real Estate Commission says, you wanna buy a residential property, here's the contract, yeah. right? You need an amendment, Here's the contract. Um, we use those promulgated forms over and over and over, right? In commercial real estate, a, a classic example is um, we submit the letter of intent. You know, we go back and forth on the terms, right? The terms not only of the purchase price, but how long is feasibility? What is the earnest money? Um, all those kind of details, right? And then the seller's attorney drafts the contract, right? So that's why that step is in there is okay to give the attorneys that are drafting the contract for the purchase agreement the baseline terms does that make sense yeah so the the letter of intent mm -hmm. we put that to we give that to the sale to the to the owner that's right and then from there their their attorney will draft a contract that's right okay typically right okay mm -hmm. so then let's say we do that we draft that contract how long is that time frame from letter of intent to maybe drafting a contract I would say less than a week, but okay. call it a week. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we do that. We have a contract now. Now we're coming in to do that feasibility. Right. Is that correct? So you, you go under contract. You, okay. um, the, you have to consummate the contract by delivering the earnest money to the title company. Right? For sure. Um, okay. And then, yes, and then you're correct. Feasibility begins. Okay. So now we're going to walk this property to see what's going on with it. We're doing our inspection. Mm -hmm. So who's typically coming? Is it a GC, like a general contractor? Right. So is you're going to start with a, a very traditional inspection. Um, and a lot of times those are the same inspectors that, that perform inspections on residential properties. Right? Okay, got but it. They would bring in a team because oftentimes it's a bigger building. It's more complex. The HVA systems are more complex, right? So they bring in their team. You get the inspection report. And then simultaneously, yes, you were right. So whatever tenant improvements that you're thinking of, I see it, I see the cart and the horse. And what I mean by that is some people start with an architect, they bring a design architect in, you sit down with them and say, this is what I want for my vision, right? This is what I want the programming of the space to look and feel like, these are the finishes that I like. And then they start to build design documents and then you can take that to the general contractor community to bid out. Oftentimes what I see now are people start with the general contractor and say, hey, I've got this 10,000 square foot building. I'm thinking about doing this type of reprogramming, this type of finishes. And they're, what they're really looking for is that early budgetary statement, right? Oh, you're looking at $100 a square foot or whatever it is. You know sure. what I mean? I recommend going through the design team first, okay. right? Because then you have actual you know, we used to call them blueprints back in the yeah. day, but now we call them construction documents that you can take to the general contractor community and get bids on, right? True proposals. Okay. Right? Um, so I take, I get the inspection done. Mm -hmm. I take an architect. I'm walking. If I don't have an architect, I'm sure as a commercial real estate agent, you work with several different architects. That's right. Okay. And it would be based off of the, the niche type of the building, the specialty and the municipality, right? So 
you know, if you're in Austin, I would recommend someone different than in Cedar Park, right? How often do they work with those um, city officials? You know? That makes sense mm -hmm. because those architects are the ones drafting the, the plans, the construction right. plans for mm -hmm. the cities reviewing. So That's they know right. what they want, what the ordinance is, all those things. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a good commercial agent will have a good lending team, good architects. 100%. And I'm assuming even good contractors. That's right. So you're really the connector for that that business owner. It's very pivotal, correct. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, so we, we go into inspection, we bring an architect, they give us, uh, a, a, how long do architectural plans take? Because you're still in this feasibility period. How That's long right. does that architectural plan take? In order to get what I would consider like a 50% design document, they, it's gonna take them 30 days, Okay, right? so 30 days later, now we have this um, design. Mm -hmm. Now I have, I shop it to contractors. Those bids take what, five days, three, five days? Yeah, it's gonna take, you know, you'd like to give them two weeks, but really I think one week is applicable. Okay, so let's let's say two weeks. So mm -hmm. 30 days on this design, two weeks on this uh, time frame to get it correct and analyze all the different contracts from the right. contractors. Mm -hmm. So now you know what it's gonna cost you, Yep. right? Now, then you go to the city and you say, hey, here are these plans, so the, the design team is still progressing, right? They need to get as far as possible to submitting the permit set as possible, right? Because you can't, you can perform demo without a permit. You cannot perform any installation without a permit, right? But you're and, not gonna improve that property till you've closed on it. Right, So, but how long is it gonna take to get that permit, right? So that's, and, a, that's my next question. That, you want that in hand, or at least a green light from the city that you will have it in hand. You know what I mean? So while the, while the general contractors are bidding the work, you're qualifying them, right? Um, and selecting the general contractor you're gonna go with, he needs to take those permit sets and actually physically, I prefer to have a permit in hand before I leave feasibility, right? Or no that I'm going to get it before we close. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. So that once I choose a general contractor, they take those design plans from the architect, mm -hmm. they get the permit hopefully issued. That's right. Okay, got it. So now permits issued, this entire time I've been in feasibility. So my my earnest money deposit, my down payment is there in escrow, right. but I haven't been making any other payments because we're not, we're not in contract yet. Correct? Well, I you, mean, we're not- You've paid in, the architect. Right. Okay. I mean, you're you're paying out of pocket for the design, right? Okay. So you're incurring costs um, during feasibility. You've paid for the inspector, and you're paying for that design, right? You're okay. You're doing that at risk. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no there's no debt payments being made. Correct. Yeah. Nothing to do. We with haven't we haven't started the loan. The property. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes people will we we did this with a residential home. We literally bought the property, then went through the whole permitting process we're paying interest on the loan the entire time until the permits were approved. Right. All wasted capital. So in this way, you don't do that because your feasibility is much longer. You just want to make sure what you want to do is feasible. That's Makes why it's sense. called it, right? Makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in that time, this this owner is that, that property's off market. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're running the risk too that they're, if they're still, if they have a mortgage on it or they have costs on it, they're still paying this out while you're deciding if you're going to execute or not. That's right. That's why the terms of the feasibility are very vitally important to both parties. Okay. Right? Understood. Because they want that earnest money to go hard. They want to see you close on the property. Right? Okay. Yeah. So, so now this entire, let's say in our situation, we'd be in this office. We're, we're running in our appointments here, clients here, things like that. Now we get the plans approved, everything's good to go, we close on that property. Mm -hmm. For most business owners that you see, do th are they still in their current office paying the rent while they're building out that new place? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's more expenses they have to account for. Right, there's an overlap, right? Because um, again, I think you've, you've got the permits, but you're not gonna touch that building until you close on it, right? You're not going to perform improvements on another guy's building. Correct. Right? So Correct. you close on the building and then now here comes your TI, right? And okay. so, or, or um, your capital improvement project on the property, right? And assume that takes six months and you have to 
um, not only do you have to perform it, but it has to be inspected by the city and by the fire marshal, and you have to get a, a ter temporary certificate of occupancy in order just to occupy it, right? And you also have to, what we call fit and finish, right? So the, the contract scope is, you know, architectural, mechanical plumbing. It doesn't involve this furniture, all those kind of things, right? So you have to, uh, you have to get your certificate of occupancy, then you have to perform your fit and finish, right? And then you have to physically move in. All that takes time, right? Okay. And that's the, that's why I always really challenge the, the OPEX and CAPEX that uh, people have in reserves, right? I mean, and imagine if the build down ends up taking on 12 months, right? Yeah. Not only does that, you're already paying debt servicing on your loan, you're paying all these costs for the construction, and you've had to do like a six month extension on your current lease, right? I mean, you can see how this onion can start unpeeling quickly, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. So the time frame to get uh, your architectural plans 30, you get it to the contractor, no, you pick the contractor two weeks. Permitting takes typically, if there's any revisions, permitting is how long of a process in, in commercial? Man, so I'm gonna use two ends of the spectrum, right? Uh, so just to renovate effectively the interior of a building, uh, you would expect to have kind of three comment sessions back and forth between the architect and the city before they're finalized, right? So I think soup to nuts, you could have it all in 90 days, right? Okay. And then on one end of the spectrum, I'm gonna use, I have a client uh, looking to buy some raw land. They're going to, they're looking to build um, athletic facilities for um, competitive sports and have a daycare center on site. My assumption is it will take a minimum of 12 months of design just before that's approved by the city for, for even to get a site development permit. Are they still in feasibility during this 12 months? We're not even under contract yet. We are going to have an initial site development meeting the day before July 3rd Okay. to see if the, even the city will green light the project okay, before we it. even go under contract. There's no reason to uh, consummate a contract if the city is not going to allow the for use. For right? sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say it's another 90 days or so. So now I'm roughly five to six months in by the time I finally got permits closing my loan. Is that correct? By the time I get permits issued? Yeah, I would say, you know, you've, you've got the permit in hand, you're closing on the deal. And I think six months is a very applicable time. Is that right? A, is, okay. I think it could be faster, right? Okay. But What's normal? Six Two, four months to six months? It's hard to say what's normal. It's okay. really depend on what level of building and permitting we're talking about, right? Because occupying an office space versus a bar where you have to get a liquor license, right? Sure. You have to, um, you know, especially where I'm gonna use a daycare, right? Where it not only has to be inspected by um, the city municipalities, has to be in inspected by the health officials, right? And, and the people that uh, dictate whether or not the daycare program is okay, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it really just depends on the use type. Okay, right. understood. So let's say that in an office, it's our style building. Uh, let's say we're at six months, and then that build out, we're expecting maybe another six months. Right. Okay, so we're kind of at a, a year right. or so. So if I'm considering, if I know, hey, I have a year left on my lease. That's right. I kind of want to start shopping the commercial real estate market maybe a year, year and a half. That's correct. Before I'm even ready to to really execute that. To try to make the transition as seamless as possible, correct. That makes sense. That's why, you know, when I first met you, I was like, we need to get started, right? Um, yeah. Because I think uh, it just really, it, most people can't grasp all of those components that have to happen um, sequentially in order for it to be successful. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So now comes the day we're finally uh, finished. We get certificate of occupancy. Then we get our, you know, uh, furniture in there, everything going. Then we have our grand opening and so right. forth. Now, um, so we got, I got so many more questions. So maybe we could do like a part two okay. to this. Um, so once I go into that, if I'm, if I'm the only occupant of the building, mm -hmm. it's pretty simple, right? But what if I'm getting a bigger space? What are what are other factors I should consider, right? And my goal is to give somebody enough information to even just understand the process of this sure. if they're going to consider it. So if you're buying a building and let's say you're looking to be a landlord and take on tenants, right? 
then we're really talking about capex and opex right because uh you have to market the building you have to um you have to find tenants right which it could take six months and then it's going to take them another six months to close right because and now you're the one covering the tenant improvement because you're now the landlord you're doing a percentage of it right percentage so of it. not not all of it okay um, i think you know again we could really hash down what those terms kind of look like right but and i'm going to use a 75 dollar per square build out the the landlord's going to say i'll give you 25 dollars got right? it mm -hmm. okay so la la last question and maybe this will lead into our part two okay should with with what's going on in this economy right now people wanting to work from home yep you know that whole COVID thing and the, hey some people are coming back well no you got to come back or no it's actually we're going to keep it that way so we don't really even need an office that much sure. are you seeing that affect commercial real estate mm -hmm. and then two are you seeing a lot of people where they're saying man i don't even want to buy a building because i'd rather do work from home and i don't have to spend the money that is going to take some time i'm going to give you um some very off the collar answers uh so that you can understand how much more we can expand right okay but first let's talk nationwide okay so nationwide retail is in big big trouble right we had riots we had looting we have you know stores that are just closing uh, in in certain states, they're they don't want to be there anymore. They're they're just losing too much product, losing too much revenue. Retail in Austin, Texas, fantastic, right? Uh, I think I think probably because of the uh, average income that we have here and maybe the way of life it is here. But whatever retail does great here in Austin, Texas, right? Office space nationwide is a humongous question mark at best, right? So. Uh, I'm going to use uh, the city of Chicago as an example, right? So uh, those skyscrapers downtown being reconverted uh, into condominiums, you know what I mean? The, the necessity to have that much office space is gone, right? Austin, Texas, I think that question is probably better answered with an office expert, right? Or someone that is their only niche. But what I can tell you is that we our future is unwritten right because we have i would say uh, more than 50 percent of the companies have done return to work whether that's 100 percent or at least a hybrid situation and so you have you have facebook and google that purchased two towers downtown and then did not occupy them right that's one end of the spectrum and then you have the other end of the spectrum of companies that are demanding employees to come back to work. They realized that the work from home solution did not achieve the productivity, right? And you're seeing these hybrids in between, right? So uh, I'm gonna use WeWork or um, these other types of co-working office spaces where companies now realize I don't need the full-time brick and mortar, maybe I need a hybrid office solution uh, for the company, right? So what I can tell you is our occupancy rates, even with those two towers being unoccupied, are in the top of the country, right? So office space here in Austin, Texas is still performing. Now, I, are we just a little bit behind and we need some more data? We need the people. So you have to remember that let's say someone signed a five to 10 year lease, right? What if they're just in year three of it and we still need two or seven years from now to see that that building will actually be vacant. You know yeah. what I mean? Like we still need some of those leases to come to term to see if they will in fact be renewed or if other occupants are coming. Right. So I think it's kind of, I don't want to say a waiting game, but I, if, if you want the true predictor of, what is office space in Austin, Texas, I would need to consult someone that is like, that is all they do. You know what I mean? Makes um, sense. But I hope I answered it as best I can. For we now. appreciate you coming out today, man. Thank you for showing up and we'll definitely do a part two. Good. Yes. All right. Guys, uh, there was a lot that we covered. If this was your first time ever even considering maybe even purchasing a building, 
Uh, I think it starts with conversations like this. It starts with ideation. It starts with meeting different people that are in your space or in this space where you live and saying, hey, what can I buy a building? What would that look like? And, you know, and then and then it, it does get exciting, by the way, if you're going that direction, because you're like, man, I'd want a gym here and I'd want to build this. And for me at this season of my life, I want to build a, a place where I can do my lifestyle. I can have my kids. We can have our kitchen. We can have the gym. We can have the barbershop. We can have the bar. We can have this like it, And that's where it gets fun. But it's you know, building a life that you're excited to, uh, that you're excited for, you know, building a, 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 a system on how you work, on how you live, on how your family interacts with where you work. Like that's the, the exciting part about life that if you work hard and you give your best that you can put yourself in a position to make that decision. So Brian, thanks for coming out, brother. Thank you. We'll see you on the next one guys. Take care. Bye-bye.